Are you looking to build a fully synced RGB setup? Well then put on your sunglasses, because by the end of this video, you'll have a setup that's blinding. In this video, I'll be your guide through building an RGB setup from start to finish. And the best part is, you'll see how to control and sync your RGB devices with just one application. The first step to building an RGB setup is to select the components and peripherals that you'll be using. Back in my day, managing RGB lighting was tricky if you didn't lock into one brand of products. Each manufacturer has their own RGB software, which meant if you wanted to do anything other than have one static color, you were basically shit out of luck. But these days, we can take advantage of applications like Signal RGB that can sync different brands together, and it means that you can pick parts without being locked into a specific brand. I'll tell you what to look for when you're buying your parts, as well as my top picks for each device category. I'll also be leaving a link to the list of every device that Signal RGB supports in the video description, if you wanna see all of your options. The first thing you should shop for is the case, because you're gonna base the rest of your part selection around it. When you're choosing a case, it's important to not only consider the looks, but also the dimensions and parts compatibility. And I've personally gotten myself into a situation where the radiator hits the RAM, and if that happens, you're gonna have a bad time. A good rule of thumb would be to double check the case dimensions and also read some reviews online to make sure the case is gonna have ample room to fit your components. The best type of case for RGB builds, in my opinion, is one with a glass panel on the front and side to show off all of that RGB goodness. But you also want it to have decent airflow, and so for this build, I'll be using Lian Li Lee's O11 Dynamic which also has an RGB strip built into the front of the case that's supported in Signal RGB. It also has plenty of room to easily manage the rat's nest of cables that's basically inevitable when you build an RGB PC. Some other cases I recommend are the Height Y40, Height Y60, Corsair 4000X, and Corsair 5000X. Next, you're gonna wanna shop for some fans. My top picks for fans with good performance would be the Corsair AF Elite fans, Corsair LL fans, Thermaltake's Tough fans, and Lee and Lee's Uni fans, which have a unique daisy chainable design that makes cable management easier. Now, if you want something that's absolutely loaded with RGB, then Corsair's QL fans or Thermaltake's Ring Quad fans would be a good choice at the expense of some performance. And you should also decide if you want 120 millimeter fans or 140 millimeter fans if the case you chose supports them. 140s are generally quieter than 120s at the same RPM, and you can get the same or better cooling with less noise, which is something to consider. And some cases like the 4000X and 5000X also come with RGB fans. So if you wanna save money, then keep the fans that you already have in the case and buy more to keep a cohesive look. For this build, I'm going with Lian Li's Uni fans because they look great, they perform well, and the cable management is so much easier. I need nine of these fans, so for this build, that's gonna cost me $230. As I was going to lay out the parts on the desk, I realized that Amazon shipped me the wrong fans. These are the SL Infinities, and I had ordered just the regulars. If I was to get a three pack of these, it would be $300, not $230. So thank you, Amazon. All right, so now it's time to figure out which motherboard you wanna use so that you can buy your CPU and RAM based on it. Almost all gaming motherboards have RGB these days. And Asus is a solid choice, both for reliability and the fact that they have great support in Signal RGB, including the RGB headers, which we're gonna be taking advantage of in this build. Now, if you're on a budget, I recommend going with previous generation motherboards. And if you don't care for Wi-Fi, you can save even more money by going with a motherboard that doesn't have Wi-Fi included. Now, for those of you with a deeper wallet, you can spend more, especially if you're looking to overclock, but my personal take is that you'll get plenty of performance with cheaper motherboards, so you don't really need to get the most expensive latest generation stuff. With that being said, I'm going with a motherboard that is two years old at the time of this video, and that's the Asus ROG Strix Z590A, which I got brand new for only $150, and that's cheaper than the RGB fans. With the motherboard selected, it's time to shop for a processor that fits the socket. And unfortunately, there aren't any RGB processors yet, so your only options are boring old regular processors. What you choose will depend on what you're looking to do. If you don't need the best performance and you're not gonna be using the PC for heavy workloads, then you'd be fine with just about any budget processor. What you wanna look for is a processor with at least six cores, which will be enough to handle modern games and decent workloads. Now, if you want a more future-proof build, then I'd suggest an eight-core processor or higher. And you can save a little bit of money by going with a processor without integrated graphics. In my case, the regular 11900K with integrated graphics was $350, so I went with the Intel i9-11900KF for $328. I saved $22 that I can use on the next item in our shopping list, which is the CPU cooler. Processors generate a lot of heat, and so you're gonna need a good cooling solution, but it also needs to include sweet, sweet RGB. And there's two ways you can approach this. The first and easiest way is to go with air cooling. I recommend the Arctic Freezer 50, which supports both AMD and Intel, and it has addressable RGB lighting. The second way to go is with liquid cooling. And today, this is easier than ever with AIOs or all-in-one liquid coolers. I recommend either the NZXT Kraken X series, which has an infinity mirror on it, or the Corsair Elite series that lets you add a custom plate on the pump head. I'm going with the Corsair H150i Elite, which has a three fan radiator that fits at the top of my case. And I also have a custom plate on it that says Signal RGB. 
I'll be sure to leave a link in the video description to where you can get one of these plates. And just make sure that whatever cooling solution you go with fits in your case and it's compatible with your motherboard because coolers can bump up against tall VRM heat sinks and RAM. And speaking of RAM, that's the next item on the shopping list. Depending on your motherboard, you're either shopping for DDR4 or DDR5 memory. DDR5 offers better bandwidth and capacity, but it has higher latencies and offers only slight performance gains in non-professional tasks. So the high cost makes it the less practical choice for most PC users, unless you really need it for demanding tasks. So if you choose to go with a motherboard that supports DDR4, then you're gonna save more money and you'll still be able to game and do all of your daily tasks just fine. I recommend getting at least 16 gigabytes of RAM, but if you can, then go for 32 gigabytes just to be more future-proof. As far as clock speeds go, I personally wouldn't go lower than 3200 megahertz. And so for this build, I got a used set of four by eight gigabyte Crucial Ballistics RGB RAM running at 3600 megahertz for only $100. You can find brand new DDR4 RGB RAM on Amazon with the same specs for about $150 or less. Whereas if you went with DDR5 RAM, it's mostly sold in pairs of two with no less than 32 gigabytes. So at the time of this video, it would cost over $300 if you wanted to fill all four RAM slots for the maximum amount of RGB. Probably the most expensive item on the shop shopping list will be the graphics card. Most graphics cards these days have RGB included, but I'd recommend going with the Asus Strix cards if you want individual LED control and signal RGB. Other brands will just be treated as one RGB zone, and that's just due to hardware limitations. In general, you should buy a graphics card that makes sense with the processor you're using. So for example, you wouldn't be able to take full advantage of a 4090 if you have an i5 processor. And I went with an EVGA for the Win 3 3090, which I picked up used for $500. It's going to pair perfectly with the processor I'm using for this build. Also with graphics cards getting bigger and bigger, make sure that the one that you're getting is gonna fit inside your case. Now that we're on the topic of things not fitting, storage. You're gonna wanna buy an SSD with plenty of space for your games because some titles like Call of Duty Warzone 2 are literally over hundred gigabytes. No, that's a lot of damage. And these days I don't even get anything less than one terabyte, especially since prices have dropped a lot over the past few years. I'm going with the one terabyte WD Black SN850X, which is a great value at the time of this video because for only $100, you'll be able to take advantage of Gen 4 PCIe and get speeds up to 7,300 megabytes per second. And now moving on to the part that's going to power everything, the power supply. You can use a power supply calculator to determine how much power you'll need for your build. I'll leave a link to the calculator in the video description. I'm gonna be going with the 1000 watt EVGA Supernova, which is gonna be more than enough power. There's also RGB power supply options out there, but that wouldn't make sense with the case that I'm going with since you wouldn't be able to see it. And if you're gonna go with one, make sure it's gonna be visible. If you do want an RGB power supply, then I recommend either the Corsair CXF series or the Asus ROG Thor if you want something way fancier. In addition to using the five volt three pin headers on the motherboard, I'll be taking advantage of the Razer ARGB controller that's gonna give me six more five volt three pin headers. There's also a large variety of other RGB controllers that you can take advantage of for your build. I made a detailed video breaking down every single RGB controller and their limitations and all of the relevant adapter cables. I'll leave a link to that guide in the video description, but don't you dare leave just yet, because you gotta finish this video first. Now with all of the essentials out of the way, it's time to spend some more money on other accessories that we can shove into the PC to make it even brighter. First, you have to get rid of the boring, perfectly functional power supply cables and replace them with the Lian Lee Strimers. I'm gonna be using both the 24 pin and the eight pin for this build. Then obviously you have to cover every nook and cranny of your PC with RGB strips. And I don't suggest going with any of the overpriced big brand RGB strips. You can get the exact same results with affordable options like SD Fab's diffused LED strip kit, which is only about 20 bucks. With graphics cards getting heavier, you should consider investing in a brace that's gonna keep it from sagging. But don't settle for just any normal brace. Get one of these RGB braces, which is also from SD Fab for about $25. And now you can support your GPU with style. Some other accessories you might consider, which I personally won't be putting in this build, are the Cooler Master RGB AIO tubes, Corsair's LC100 triangles, which are basically just mini nano leaves for the inside of your PC, and they're really expensive. And if your motherboard doesn't have a heatsink on the SSD, then you can slap on the RGB SSD heatsink from SD Fab. That covers everything for the PC portion of the shopping list, and now it's time for everything else, starting with the monitor. The Signal RGB supports a few monitors with RGB built in, the Alienware AW3423D, the LG Ultra Gear 27 GN950, the Razer Raptor, and MSI's Mag Series monitors. If you like any of these monitors, then you're good to go, but you shouldn't get a monitor just for the built-in RGB. Make sure it has the specs and size you're looking for, and then you can always add your own RGB with strips later. Now moving on to keyboards, my recommendation for a membrane RGB keyboard if you're on a budget would be the SteelSeries Apex 3. If you can spend a little bit more for a budget mechanical keyboard, then I would recommend the Corsair K60 Pro SE. If you want a keyboard that just absolutely maxes out in the RGB department, then you should take a look at the Rocket Vulcan 2, which has two LEDs under every key, 
and also an RGB wrist rest. You can also get QMK keyboards to work with Signal RGB, and that would be keyboards from brands like Glorious, Red Dragon, Drop Control, and more. It requires flashing the firmware, and if you do want to learn more about that, then I suggest hopping on the Signal RGB Discord server. Now for mice, the SteelSeries Rival 600 has dropped in price to less than $40 recently, which makes it a really good budget option. But if you want more RGB, the Razer Basilisk V3 has a sweet RGB underglow. And then there's the Rockat Kone XP, which is a bit more expensive, but has the most RGB I've ever seen on a mouse, and that's what I'll be using for this setup. And of course, you can't have a mouse without having a mouse pad to rest it on. And why settle for a simple mouse pad when you can get one with RGB? The SteelSeries Quick Prism is my top recommendation for a regular size RGB mouse pad. As for extended RGB mouse pads, Razer recently dropped one of the most impressive RGB mouse pads that I'll be using for this setup. It's called the Strider and it has 19 addressable zones, which is something that's never been done before on an extended mouse pad. With that being said, it's insanely expensive. For a cheaper extended mouse pad, consider either the MM700 or the HyperX Pulsefire Matte instead. Next, you're gonna need a headset so you can muffle the sound of your wallet screaming. The cheapest headset that Signal RGB supports is the Patriot Viper V380, but I'd suggest the SteelSeries Arctis 5, which is a reputable, slightly more expensive option that I'll be using for this setup. If you want something premium, then I'd go with the Corsair Virtuoso SE. And now you need to get a stand for your headset because we aren't gonna rest our headset on the desk like peasants. There's only two that I'd actually recommend, and it's either the Razer Base Station V2 or the Corsair ST100. I like the base station sleek and round look, so I'll be using that for this setup. Finally, you need speakers to complete the setup. And Signal RGB supports Logitech's G560, Razer Leviathan V2, Razer Namo, and Creative Lab Sound Blaster X Katana. All of these are great options depending on your budget and needs, but I'll be using Razer's Namo simply because I like the way they look on the desk. That covers all of the essentials, but let's quickly look at some other products you might find interesting. If you planned on getting a mouse bungee for your setup, then the Razer Mouse Bungee V3 would be the perfect addition. Are you looking to stream or record audio? Well, SignalRGB supports the HyperX Quadcast S and the Rockat Torch microphone. What's that? You're still not satisfied with all the RGB you already have? More! Corsair's LT100 lighting towers are the perfect way to add even more flair to your setup. And finally, if you have a phone or device that supports wireless charging, Razer has you covered yet again with the RGB charging pad. All right, so now with all of the shopping out of the way, it's time to get started with the build. But before you do, I recommend you test all of your parts before you put it in the case because it would really suck to find out that you have a dead LED or some other defective parts after you've already put it all together. Now I've done the testing off camera so I know everything works just fine. Let's get into it. The first thing you should do is remove all of the panels from your case. It's gonna make the case lighter and easier to work with. In my particular case, I have to remove the top panel first before all of the other panels can slide out. Make sure to read your manual if you aren't sure how the panels come off of your case. Be extra careful with the glass panels so that you don't end up like these posts on Reddit. Next, prepare the motherboard by installing the CPU, RAM, SSD, and the back plate for the liquid cooler. You'll want to take out the tiny screw and standoffs that's included in the box, because you're going to need that to screw in the SSD later. Some motherboards like this one already have the standoff prepared for you though, so it just depends on what motherboard you have. I suggest resting your motherboard on the box for a static safe workspace. To open the CPU socket, push down on the latch and pull out. When you install the CPU, make sure to match the notches on the CPU with the notches on the socket. It's sort of impossible to mess this up if you're gentle. Once the CPU is inside, give it a light wiggle and make sure it's seated properly, and then you can close the lid. Push down on the latch with some force and secure it in place. The CPU cover will pop off and make sure to keep this because you may need it someday if you decide to resell the motherboard. It'll protect the pins from damage. When installing RAM, make sure you line up the notch or you'll end up like this. You'll need to apply a light pressure until you hear a click sound. Most motherboards these days have a heatsink over the SSD slot, so you have to unscrew that first. Then make sure to peel the film off of the thermal pads before installing the SSD. Then you kind of just insert your SSD into the pins at a slight angle, push down, and screw it in. Then put the heatsink back on and you're all set. Then flip your motherboard over and install the backplate for the liquid cooler. Most backplates have adhesive that will keep it in place so that you can flip the motherboard over again and screw in the standoffs. With all of that out of the way, it's time to mount the motherboard in the case. Don't forget to put the IO shield on if your motherboard doesn't have it pre-installed. Line up the motherboard with the holes for the screws and then get to work with a screwdriver. Now to install the power supply, if you have a modular power supply, then I highly suggest putting all of the cables you need on it first and then mount it inside of the case. Mounting a power supply is easy, it's usually just four screws, and make sure to pay attention to where the fan is facing, this is going to depend on which case you chose and if you went with an RGB power supply that you want to show off. After installing the power supply, connect all of the important cables to the motherboard, like the 24-pin cable, the CPU cable, the front panel connectors, and the HD audio cable. 
If you don't know how to connect the front panel connectors, then refer to the manual. A tip from me is that there's a little triangle on the reset and power switch connectors that indicates plus and the side without the triangle is minus. Now you can go ahead and install any RGB controllers that you're going to need. I skipped ahead here and while it started off really strong, I gave up trying to cable manage all the SATA connectors so I just ended up shoving them like this. Consider this a more realistic guide that shows you the ugly side of RGB PC building. I'm using six RGB controllers, the Lianli Strymer Plus controller, the Commander Core controller, which is required for the Corsair AIO, the Razer ARGB controller, and three Lianli Infinity fan controllers. The reason I need to use all three of the included fan controllers is because if I was to connect all nine fans onto one controller, I would experience laggy RGB effects with signal RGB. It's purely a limitation with the firmware on Lianli's controllers, and I go over this in more detail in my RGB controllers guide that I mentioned earlier. Essentially, three fans per controller is the sweet spot. If you ever need more internal USB ports, you can buy these cheap hubs which I'll link in the video description. With all the controllers installed, it's time to mount the fans and the radiator. When it comes to thermal paste, all you need is a small dot in the middle of the processor. Then place the pump on top and move it around slightly to spread the thermal paste. Hand tighten the screws in a crisscross pattern until it gets really hard to turn. Then you're done. Now for the accessories, the SD fab strips are going around the motherboard and they include these convenient routing clips. But I'll be completely honest with you guys, the adhesive isn't that great and it's not easy to get the strip to sit around the motherboard. Install the graphics card and then the RGB brace. It may take a few tries before you get it to the correct height to support the graphics card. After that, connect the cables to the graphics card. The last step is to plug in all of the RGB headers. In my situation, I'm using the 3-pin header at the top of the motherboard for the Strymer cables, and then the two 3-pin headers at the bottom is for the RGB strip and the GPU brace. Finally, the case strip connects into the Razer ARGB controller, and I have a ton of ports left over to fuel the RGB addiction. Now to close all of the panels on the case and hide the worst cable management I've ever done. This is how the setup looks with everything on the desk. All right, so I'm gonna do my best to go over how to configure your devices once you're inside of Signal RGB, because when you first load up the application, none of the devices are gonna be synced up. Um, you have to go in there and you have to configure everything. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of go over this as I do it in real time here. So to so start off, I know that I have three devices connected to the motherboard headers, so I'll start there. Now I know that I have the Lianli Strymers connected to channel one because if you look over here, you can see that they're flashing red. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select Strymer, Strymer Plus. For channel two, I know I have the GPU brace because you can see it flashing blue right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the SDFAB 16 RGB GPU holder. And then finally on channel three, I have the LED strips around the motherboard and you can see they're flashing green. So that's channel three. So I'll select the SDFAB premium addressable LED strip. And I'm gonna need two of those. All right, now with everything configured on the motherboard, I can move on to all of the Lian Li fan controllers. And on each of those controllers, I have three fans connected on channel one. So I'm just gonna select Lian Li SL120 Infinity three times. And then I'm gonna do the same thing on the other two controllers. All right, next I'll configure the Razer ARGB controller and I only have one device connected to this on channel six and you can see it pulsing purple here. It's the case strip. And so for this one, we actually don't have a component already created, but I know that there's 27 LEDs so I can create a custom strip. And there we go. And for the commander core, I really don't have to do anything here because I don't have any fans connected. It's just the AIO, which works by default. 
Now, I will warn you that if you have the LCD connected, you'll have to select it in settings. But in this particular case, I just have the regular one. And then I can just tell it to ignore the warning since there's no need for it. And now that everything's been configured, you can see that all of the devices are completely in sync. So I'm not going to be going over the rest of the process because I have a really detailed tutorial for configuring layouts, effects, and other things in Signal RGB. So I recommend that you go check that out if you're interested in learning, you know, how to use Signal RGB to its fullest potential. Now let's roll the footage of the setup fully synced with Signal RGB. Thanks for watching this video. I hope it helps you build your RGB setup and be sure to comment, like, and subscribe to the channel for more videos.